Hello, and welcome to this uh, fireside chat as part of the 5G Thinking uh, Project Toolkit. Uh, and in this video, we will be talking about the gnarly and thorny problem of sites and planning, uh, which, is, uh, which is undoubtedly everyone's favorite, uh, but amazing how, uh, how critical it is, uh, always critical path for, for, for these types of projects. Um, so my name is Peter Shimon, I'm Head of Innovation for Cisco UK, and I'll be, be chairing this, this conversation. Uh, and I have two people with me who uh, know a great deal uh, uh, about the challenges and, uh, and, 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 and tricks to trade in, in this space. Um, and I'm going to come to each of them individually to, to introduce themselves and then we'll, uh, and then we'll get started. Uh, so Shona, if I could come to you first. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Um, I'm Shona Croy uh, with Orkney Islands Council. Um, I'm going to hasten to add I'm not a planner by trade. Uh, I represent uh, the field of, of economic development um, and have been representing the council on the 5G New Thinking project um, and have helped put together some of the content on planning and consenting. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, and Nikki? Uh, yeah, uh, Nikki Linklater, I'm one of the directors of CloudNet who have been um, helping work on the project with the network and um, doing the mast sites. Super. Uh, thank you both, and, and thank you for, for, for making the time uh, to, to, to contribute to this. Um, if I could start, uh, Nikki, can I come, can I come to you um, first? Uh, what, 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 what type of sites are we talking about here? What, 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 what the communities need to, need, need to be looking for? Um, firstly, um, it's a, it helps to have a good understanding of um, how many people um, you know, in the area that you're potentially looking for. So you're looking for a cluster, um, then you'd be looking for somewhere with height. Height's really beneficial. Um, access to the site and power. Uh, power's a, a huge issue. I mean, you might see a, a brilliant uh, hilltop and think fantastic, but then uh, if you can't run power to it, well, you can, but it, without costing an arm and a leg, so you've really got to take into account, um, yeah, the power, the height, how much you, I mean, mass sites don't come cheap. So you have to make sure that uh, it's financially feasible, that you've got enough of a cluster around you as well. And uh, give me some examples of some of the locations we've, we've, we've had sites, uh, mass sites and uh, radios up in, uh, uh, in Orkney. So, for example, um, Kirkbray and Westry, one of the, the 5G mile sites, it's, um, it's very, it's high up. It's basically um, sees just about all of Westry at, you know, at some, some point, um, which made it a very, it sees Papi, um, which was obviously another 5G um, site. It was next to um, power. I had was straight um, off the main road, so access to it was uh, a win-win. So it was ideal in every situation. Um, so getting um, power to it, getting um, comms fiber to it wasn't a problem. Getting access to the um, cranes to lift the mast to do the foundations you know and then of course if you walk around uh, Westry you'll see it from practically every area so it was it was one of the best mass sites we could come across. Excellent um, and uh, how how do you begin conversations with with landowners um, when when you identify these sites what's what's in it for them what do we find that they they, they care about? Um, I think being in a rural area, um, probably if you know the person that you're going to speak to, it, it's it's a real help. Um, most landowners in a rural community are really willing to actually help the community themselves. So if they think that they're doing something good to benefit, then they're more than happy to allow like a section of, of a field to to you know have a mast on it i mean for us we find that um if we can provide them with a really good 
internet services, then they're they're really happy. I mean, most landowners will never sell a piece of land. Um, you know, it's it's always a rent, but sometimes it can be quite a you know a nominal fee. Um, so it, they really are quite. Um, I wouldn't say easy going because they're business people. <laughs> But they do, they do want to, to help the people around them, especially if a rural area um, has more of an aging community. They, they want to maybe think about getting, like keeping the younger generation there. So obviously having some form of internet, good internet service is, is also, um, you know, a, a tick box. Sure. Uh, yes. And it's, it's interesting because the, there's a uh, there's often a difference between when a community talks to its own about those opportunities versus if an outside provider comes in and wants to wants to take that. And I, I've seen that before. Um, so, do you think there's a there is that advantage if it's if if you if you're coming at it from the view of we're also a community a community group a community organisation um, wanting to wanting to help. Yeah, I mean, um, I found for um, for us, because you're local yourself, you understand the problems, you you know what you want to achieve and how it can be so beneficial. Um, they they understand that we are trying to do the best for the community as well. While I I am aware that some of the landowners that we've spoken to have had um, you know bigger companies um, coming to them to ask and they've just not been interested because they've just felt that well you know they kind of will abuse the situation so for for locals there's a trust and if they trust the people that's coming to them that are like from the you know the area then that makes a, a huge difference thank you Nikki um Sean, if I could um I think of brains as someone who isn't uh, a planner, um, but uh, tell us how how can we best work with with planning departments? What is it that they uh, that, that, that that would help to to smooth that process and uh, and to make uh, uh, make make applications go uh, go smoothly? I think the first thing I'd say is I very much agree with uh, what what Nikki has said. Um, you know, if, if you're dealing with a project locally um, and explaining the benefits of that project to a community, then you're far more likely to get buy-in than if you're viewed as a, a as a what I would call a corporate, a more corporate company coming into an area to basically try to deliver a service rather than provide a service to the community on behalf of the community. Um, and I'd say when it comes to the, the process of obtaining planning and getting consent for a project, then the first thing I would say is have, have an early contact with your planning department. Um, they, they, they operate a number of policies and procedures that they themselves have to follow. So I would certainly encourage uh, very early contact when you've, when you've got a project in mind, uh, even if it's a case that you don't actually know specifically what it's going to be at that stage, Go and get some early advice from them um, and you know just explain what it is you're trying to do uh, find out some of the high level issues that you know there might well be for instance some no-go area so before you even start you know you cannot develop in this area for whatever reason you know the, so there might be some restrictions that will just just help you at that very early stage just to screen the sites as you as you start um, so that would be be my initial initial uh, recommendation Excellent. Um, and uh, as you as you go through that process, are there uh, are there particular uh, stakeholders that are the most relevant? Are there, there areas of support you should be looking to uh, 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 looking to get behind you? Well, I, th I think initially there's a chicken and egg element to this. Um, again, as Nikki said, you know, identify what you think your prime sites are and speak to the landowner. Uh, there's very little point, in other words, applying for planning permission if the landowner himself or herself isn't amenable to the to the proposal. So um, there is a, a little bit of a iterative process, if you like. You're, you know, the chances of you arriving, meeting the five people you need for each mass site and them all saying yes, crack on, 
all at the same time. Um, I'm sure that Nikki would have absolutely loved that if that had been the case. Um, but, you know, the, 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 there is a coming and going that needs to happen between you and the landowners. Um, but the more you have a, a, a project in mind and sites and locations in mind, um, Nikki will be better able to tell you that you, you then would design what you think your optimum, optimum uh, project is. So it'll depend, for instance, on the height of the masts that you're wanting. Um, it'll depend on a number of factors. And the more detail you actually have of what it is you're trying to do, um, then you'll then get advice and guidance uh, from planning colleagues. Most uh, planning applications these days are done online using planning portals. So they're um, I'm not easy to do. I don't mean that at all. Um, many people are actually encouraged to use an agent, but um, you know, nine times out of 10 within a community, there will be somebody that has that knowledge and experience um, and have the skills to, to put together a, a, a planning application these days. Um, so I would encourage um, that to happen. Most of your statutory consultations will take place through the planning application itself and will be in some ways done on your behalf. But again, if you know local agents or you know your, your local RSPB reserve, or you may well know um, Scottish Water, you may well know all the, the sort of statutory consultees. But the, the other aspect of uh, planning is, uh, is the community itself. And I think if you're doing a community project, uh, keeping your community involved in it, letting them know what you're planning on doing, um, you know, having those discussions early doors is another excellent way of, what I would say, is uh, preventing any um, uh, misconceptions within your community. Uh, they're ultimately going to be both the customer and the, the, the you know, the user of the service. Um, and you will get individuals who, who uh, could potentially be nimbiest in their in their approach. Um, so it's always best to try and well, I'd ward off potential objections uh, before they occur. So you know, the more involvement you can have at the early days, um, a it's going to save you time, and B it's going to save you save you money in the long run. Sure. Uh, that's just a switching point. Um, and Nikki, from our, our experience and well, from your experience and all generally, um, how beneficial has that community engagement um, been, and, and and what form does that take for you? Oh, um, it's it's hugely advantageous to have the community, you know, on board. And I mean, you, you know, with them, um, for example, in Papi, you know, we. We went and met with the community, you know, several times. We discussed what we were, you know, going to be doing, what the project was all about. You know, a, a lot of questions on their side were answered. And I think keeping them, you know, the communication going when it came to um, the planning application going in and, you know, for obviously, you know, the neighbourhood kind of, is there any objections? You, you know, there was the, there was no holdups in that respect because everybody understood uh, what was what was going on. So it's communication and keeping them, you know, in the know is is really really important. Um, a question I'll put to both of you, but maybe, um, Nikki, I'll come to you first. Um, are there any uh, kind of common pitfalls or mistakes uh, when thinking about? Uh, uh, Particularly, you know, we're also talking about about, about mast sites and, and and places for for radio deployment. Um, but but yeah, any 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 advice on, on what not to do and how not to do things? <laughs> um, what not to do? Um, that's quite a tricky one, actually. I would say one of the big big things is just never assume. And what Shona said, try your utmost to meet with the planners first. Once you have an area in mind and you've spoken to the communities, really try and engage with the planning team because if you don't have them on side, it can be a, a very long, long journey ahead of you. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that, Shona? Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, very, very... Um... Uh, politically correctly put. Um, I think uh, there's, there's two aspects to, to planning. The one is it's the policies that govern planning, um, which is a local plan, which is published on most local authority websites that, that explains the kind of 
high level um, aspiration for the built environment um, in any area. And then you've got um, the actual application and consent process, which um, they, they are linked, but they're also separately separately done. Uh, so it's a different, often a different um, different staffing. Um, and uh, I think uh, the, the one thing I would say is attention to detail a wee bit, because if the forms aren't filled in properly, then they can be returned and it can cause a lot of um, frustration, shall we say, um, and misunderstandings, I would even go as far as. So, um, you know, I, I, during during COVID, I think it's, it's, it, it's fair to say there was issues with no face-to-face -face contact with planning officers, and that, that does make things difficult, and it and it can lead you to um, a position where one party maybe misunderstands another. So um, I think uh, a good quality application with uh, with information that it's a bit like applying for a job. In other words, if you if you fill in the answers uh, to the questions being asked, then then you're much more likely to have a smooth passage. Full power of inaccurate uh, documentation in, uh, before in my lifetime. Um, uh, uh, yes, um, always, always, always double check. Read against the criteria. Um, uh, if I, um, I've just come to both of you for some some closing thoughts um, as we we at the end of our time. Um, uh, uh, Nikki, anything uh, that we haven't covered that you think is useful for, for people to know and understand, um, uh, or, or what's what's the most important? Uh, what the takeaway has been for you? Um, I think something that maybe also possibly needs to be thought about when you're looking at a mass site is potentially what kind of um, communications, what kind of technology you're going to actually be using. Um, you know, whether it's a um, microwave, obviously you've got to ensure that if you're in the middle of a forest, you're not going to get very far. Um, with a uh, line of sight or licensing and um, make sure that you know if you're going to use spectrum uh, licensing then you know you'll get full approval or even if you're thinking about fiber um, is it possible to to run fiber from where your 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 mass site is to the you know to the nearest houses so that's actually for us with the the 5g technology that we've been using that was quite um that was quite a big task in the fact of trying to locate where the potential sites could be in order to get the, the best value for like where all the the houses were going to you know the trialists were going to be so really take heed of what you're actually going to use in comparison to where you want to start your your kind of mass structures from super thank you uh and uh, uh shona uh any anything we've uh we've, we've omitted that you think uh, that, uh people should know in, in terms of the consenting aspect no um you know the, the, the one thing and the disappointing aspect of of, uh, of rural connectivity though is that um, you know, to make something cost effective, you do need a number of people and a number of customers to justify the investment. Um, and so, you know, working with your community uh, to actually get uh, enough potential interest in it is crucial to then uh, getting the necessary infrastructure built and operated. Um, and I'd encourage, you know, uh, communities that, that uh, are interested in in sorting out their, their own problems to work out what skills they have in their communities and um, you know make, make use of the skills and knowledge around them. Uh, but if they are stuck, there is information and help out there and to, to, to you know not be scared to ask. Um, uh, the one thing I've learned through this project um, and have uh, on several occasions exhibited is there's no such thing as a, as a stupid question. So um, that goes with your planning and consenting uh, in much the same way. And I think um, the you know core to it is also having the landowners uh, bought into the project and understanding its benefits. So I think as Nikki said, one of the very first things we did was identify potential sites and then spoke to the landowners early doers um, you know, nine out of 10 of them straight away went, I want to help 
my community. It's a problem not just for me, but for the future generation. So it's it's again working out why you're doing something and getting that getting that support early doors is uh, is is a sort of ma massive help. Super. Uh, and of course, uh, for other sources of advice, um, the uh, 5G New Thinking Toolkit uh, is an excellent resource. Um, I encourage you to uh, take uh, take take a look um, where. We'll be gathering the uh, the thoughts and collective wisdom and experience of uh, of uh, uh, Shona and Nikki and indeed others uh, who from the project who have been been part of that journey. Um, Shona, Nikki, thank you very much uh, for joining me. Uh, that was uh, that was most insightful and helpful. Uh, and thank you very much for watching. <laughs>